bring you greetings from my president at Southeastern Seminary, Dr. Danny Aiken, uh, who loves the nations. And I bring you greetings from my pastor in Wake Forest, North Carolina, Dr. Randy Mann, who loves Africa. And when he learned that I was coming here, he told me that one, he was jealous, and two, to greet you. And so I have, I have done that. I, I really am honored to be with you. I love doing this, not because I have the privilege of presenting, but because I have the privilege of learning from you, my brothers and sisters from around the world. And I come here this week to listen and to learn, and I trust that I will go back to the States as a better man of God, a better professor, because I have been with you. And so thank you for this privilege. Well, our task this morning is to consider the question, what is, what is missions? Let me tell you about a study of American Christians. In, in our time to discuss these thoughts, I would love to hear if any of these characteristics describe African Christians as well. In 2021, a researcher named George Barna did a survey of folks in America who identify as Christian. And their team asked them, which of the following statements best describes missions for you? So let me tell you what these American Christians said. 41% said that missions is proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ wherever you are. 19% said it is the calling to proclaim the gospel to a specific people group or region. 15% said it is the holistic transformation of people's lives by caring for their physical, social, and spiritual needs. 12% said that missions is an attitude of the heart and mind to be about the business of God. 9% said it is an all-encompassing word for social justice, advocacy, and relief work. And 4% said none of these. They continue to ask other questions, asking, what is it for you that most makes up missions? 47% said it is sharing about Jesus with other people. 24% said that it is starting churches in places that don't have them. And 19% said it involved overseas or cross-cultural work. So Barda and his team did this research, and here's what they concluded about American Christians or those who identify as Christian. Their conclusion was this. They aren't always sure what to make of missions. And I think there are reasons for that. Honestly, I think one reason is that too many pastors preach too little on the Great Commission. And I would add to that that those who do often do so without a personal burden for the nations. And it loses the passion of the, the message. And then I think another reason that this is the case for American Christians is that we Americans regrettably still haven't realized that there's a world much bigger than ours outside of North America. So I think, I think there are reasons for that taking place with American Christians. I hear that, though, and I go to the scriptures, and I want you to get your Bibles. I want you to turn with me, first of all, to Matthew 28, our theme text for this week, Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. I want to read to you the expressions of the Great Commission in the New Testament. Matthew 28, 18 and following, Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you, how long? Always, to the end of the age. Go to Mark chapter 16. The end of that gospel. In an ending that I recognize is debated among scholars, but 
The expression of the Great Commission in Mark 16, verse 15, echoes what we read in the other Gospels. And so here's what we read in verse 15. Then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Go with me to Luke 24. I'll begin reading in verse 45 and read through verse 47. Listen to Luke's expression of the Great Commission. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then finally, go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I said to you that I think one reason that American Christians struggle with determining what missions is is that too many pastors preach too little on this topic, and yet this topic echoes through the scriptures. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, but five times in the New Testament, we read this kind of expression from the lips of our Lord. And whenever we hear that kind of repetition, what do we know? God wants us to do what? Pay attention, listen. And why is it that God would remind us of those kinds of things so many times unless it is that we are a forgetful people? And then in too many cases, we do not default into doing missions. We need the reminder to do missions. And it seems to me as we think about what constitutes mission, what makes up this task, it is right to look at these Great Commission passages together and look at the non-negotiables that are there for all of us as believers. For these, these reminders are for every one of us. But in these Great Commission passages, we find ourselves driving down into the heart of missions. And that is to take the gospel to the nations, to all the peoples of the world. So I want to spend some time with you for just a few moments talking about some things that I recognize you already know in looking at these passages. But I do that because God reminds us of these things over and over and over again. And thus it must be that we need the reminders as well. So as I look at these texts, here's what I see as we think about what missions is. First, making disciples is non-negotiable. Making disciples is non-negotiable. Jesus' mandate to his disciples in Matthew 28 was clear. Make disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations, of all peoples. You know this. You know the imperative, the command of that text is to make disciples rather than go, though to assume that go assumes no imperatival force misses the point, and I will come back to that. You do know, though, that our task is to make disciples. This work of making disciples is really the umbrella of all that we do. It is the umbrella work of sharing the gospel with a non-believer, leading that non-believer to come to faith in Christ, baptizing him or her in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching that new believer to obey everything that Jesus commanded, including that new believer turning around and making disciples himself or herself. All of that, all of that is the task of making disciples. It is not an easy one. It's not an easy one for the call of Jesus that we extend to others is to count the costs. It is to take up the cross 
It is to deny self. It is to plow forward. It is to never look back. It is to die if that is the call of God on our lives. It's not an easy task to make disciples. Evangelism is a first task in this work. The disciples were not to wait for non-believers to come to them. Rather, they were to take the initiative to do evangelism, to take the initiative to proclaim the good news to people who needed to hear of Jesus. Such, such evangelism would model the heart of God who pursued Adam and Eve in their sin, whose son came to us, dwelt among us, and died in our place while we were yet sinners. And the one who died for us demanded that his followers, including us, would take that good news to the ends of the earth. That news, too, is non-negotiable. There is one way to the Father, and that is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ through his shed blood. We must evangelize. But this task of making disciples is, is not finished with evangelizing, however. Teaching to obey is an equally non-negotiable part of the Great Commission and of missions. Indeed, this process begins with leading non-believers to trust Jesus and to turn from their sin. It's followed by our directing new Christians to walk in Christ in that lifelong task of obeying Christ. The former leading people to Christ is marked by baptism. The latter, that is, leading others to obey, is marked by teaching. Thus, this process of evangelizing and teaching matters. This process of making disciples that ends only with conversion, if we stop there with conversion of the the evangelized, this process is incomplete at best. In fact, if we stop this process with conversion, with evangelism, the omission can be disastrous. Untaught believers are ill-equipped to face trials. They are untrained to recognize false teachings. And they are unprepared to teach others. It seems to me that perhaps this is particularly the case on the front edge of darkness where the enemy wants to devour new believers and shut down the church before it ever gets started. So what we do as educators, what we do as equippers, what we do as trainers, as those who equip the next generation of believers to, to make disciples themselves, that really matters for the work of the Great Commission and thus for the work of missions. It's non-negotiable that we are going to make disciples. Here's number two. Making disciples of the nations is non-negotiable. It's not just that we make disciples, but we are to make disciples of the, the nations. Let me remind you of the text, Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of whom? Tell me. Of all nations. Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to whom? All creation. Luke 24, 45. Repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Acts 1.8, we're going to be God's witnesses even to the ends of the earth. Jesus' disciples heard this command on the mountain. They were to make disciples of all the nations. Luke's gospel uses the same phrase, repentance preached to all the nations. Mark doesn't use that same terminology, but to go into all the world echoes that similar mandate. Luke's gospel, Acts 1, they describe this task geographically. Not only that we're reaching peoples, but we are going to places. This gospel preached beginning in Jerusalem and then extending to the ends of the earth. There the gospel would take root in Jewish territory, but, but would be followed by an ever-broadening proclamation to the peoples of the world. 
the church would take the initiative to go to the nations. And surely, surely that is the marker of what we do as we do missions. This is a call to cross the boundaries, to cross the cultures, to proclaim the gospel where the name of Jesus has not been heard. It's a call to get the gospel to all the world. We simply cannot get away from our responsibility to get the gospel to the nations. It echoes through these Great Commission passages. And to do that, to reach the nations, there is inherent in that necessarily a call to go. Go and make disciples. I've already noted with you that the command in Matthew 28 is make disciples. But go, the word go, the sense of go, carries a much weightier sense in this text than we often give that term. On one hand, practically, how can we get the gospel to the nations if nobody goes? This practically it is the case. But my colleague at Southeastern Seminary, Dr. Ben Merkel, great scholar, has shown that go in Matthew 28 is designed to be parallel to the main verb, that is, make disciples, and it thus carries the imperative mood of that, of that command. Go is just as much a command as make disciples. Dr. Merkel says this, that this text, if we understand it that way, there are multiple implications. First, the church must be intentional in reaching the nations. If that's the command, we must do it. Second, the church must invest its resources, money and people and time in the process of fulfilling Jesus' commission. And third, Dr. Merkel says, there must be a willingness on the part of individuals and families to go because we are to make disciples of all the nations. But he continues to write this. Let me quote his words. Nobody argues that every Christian must participate in fulfilling the Great Commission in the same way. Some cannot or should not go if we are limiting the concept of going to cross-cultural missions. We wholeheartedly acknowledge that some participate through their giving and praying, and yet there seem to be far too few who are willing to leave their family and friends behind in order to bring the good news to those who have never heard. End of quote. The bottom line is this. Though not every person is called to go in the sense of crossing cultures, some surely are. And it is our responsibility to not only consider the possibility of that calling for ourselves, but it's our responsibility to walk alongside churches in calling out the called. For unless the called obey this command, we can never reach the nations. We are to make disciples. We are to make disciples of the, of the nations. Next. Proclamation of the word is non-negotiable. Proclamation of the word is non-negotiable. Here's what Luke's gospel says. Repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. That's Luke's Great Commission passage. Repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed, would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. That expression is comparable to Mark's expression, preach the gospel to all creation, similar to Acts 1, where you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and following to the ends of the earth. And in John 17, verse 18, John chapter 20, verse 21, there are similar understandings. William Hendrickson, the commentator, says this about those texts. The two comparisons in John 17 and John 20, that is between the Father sending the Son and the Son sending the disciples, Here's what Dr. Hendrickson says. They blend into one idea, which is this. Just as the Father has sent Jesus into the world with a message, and in Dr. Hendrickson's writing, that's emphatic. So also Jesus 
sent the disciples into the world with a message. The message, moreover, is the same, that of redemption in Christ. Without question, proclamation, verbally speaking the message, is essential to doing the Great Commission and thus essential to doing missions. That should not be surprising to us if we believe Romans 10. So help me out here. Verses 14 and 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not what? Believed. And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are what? Sent. Apart from hearing the gospel, no person in any people group of the world can be saved. Thus, proclaiming the word is imperative. John Piper put it this way, the front line of missions is the preaching of the word of God, the gospel. Through, through preaching the gospel, Jesus' disciples would, in, in the words of New Testament scholar Rob Plummer, they would announce the news that would divide for eternity the forgiven from the unforgiven. They would hear, some would find forgiveness through faith and repentance, others would remain unforgiven in rebellion. But we must proclaim, we must proclaim. Proclamation of the world in this task of doing missions is non-negotiable for us. Now, that's not to suggest that we're not to minister to the needs of the world or to address needs of injustice and unrighteousness. The early church obviously focused on leading people to faith through the proclamation of the, of the word, but they also engaged in social ministry. We read, for example, of their caring for widows in Acts 6, and so we can't get away from that. I'm not arguing that we do not do those things. But I do think as we look at the priority of the text, proclamation of the gospel is priority. Keith Ferdinando put it this way. As, as he looks at social ministry, he argues this, that social ministry is, and I quote his words, a consequence of apostolic mission rather than its substance. He says it does not have the same place of the making of disciples itself. And then he explains why. And this relates to the obvious fact that Christian social engagement depends upon the existence of Christians. And there would be none if disciples were not made. We must proclaim the word. It is non-negotiable that we make disciples. It is non-negotiable that we make disciples of the nations. And there we see the crux of mission, crossing, crossing the boundaries to take the good news. It is non-negotiable that we proclaim the word to the ends of the earth. And then I would add this. It is non-negotiable that we do the Great Commission. It is non-negotiable that we do the task of the Great Commission. We drill down into the heart of missions by taking the gospel to the, to the ends of the earth. Both the repetition and the location of the Great Commission passages in the New Testament imply the seriousness and the significance of those words. All four of the gospels, we read them, all four of the gospels, includes some type of sending, going, proclaiming statement near the end, suggesting some climactic seriousness behind this position. Acts 1.8, we recognize, is different. It's, it's the beginning of 
that book. But that text serves, as, as John Paul ha, has noted, serves more as a rough outline of the, of the book of Acts and a theme verse for Luke's second volume. But here's what we know. It is, it is undeniable. It is undeniable that near the end of his ministry and at the beginning of the church's mission, Jesus called believers. He mandated that believers must take the gospel to the nations. They must. We must go. We must proclaim. We must make disciples. We must baptize them. We must teach them. Jesus gave us those words. It is Matthew's gospel that reminds us most obviously of Jesus' authority. All authority on heaven and earth is given to him. It is out of that authority in which he speaks. And you know what that means? We must listen. The one who speaks these words is the eternal Son of God come to earth. The one of whom the prophets had spoken. He is the beloved Son who pleases the Father. He is the one who teaches like no one else has ever taught. He is the one who speaks and demons flee. He is the one who heals lepers, who lowers fevers, gives legs to paralytics, and raises the dead. He is the feeder of 5,000. He's the transfigured one on the mountain, yet the one who welcomes children with open arms. He is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he has the right to to tell us what we must do. And as the Father sent him, so he sends us. And we must go, and we must challenge others to go. My friend Zane Pratt and a couple of other writers wrote a book called The Introduction of Global Missions, and Here's, here's what they write. Here's their conclusion about authority. His authority, that is Jesus' authority, gives his followers both the right to take the gospel to every nation, whether they welcome it or not, and the obligation to take it to every nation, whether it is safe and convenient or not. In a quote. We must be about the business of reaching people for Christ and equipping them among the nations, particularly through planting healthy churches. And all of this by necessity. By necessity means crossing cultural boundaries. And that's the task that we call missions. Now, I suspect we know that. I also suspect, though, that there are numerous Great Commission passages in the Scriptures inspired by God because even we who teach this stuff need reminders. And this is our opportunity together this week to be reminded and to be challenged. And I, I confess to you that I come here asking the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? My wife, Pam. We are press, pressing toward the end of our career at some point. I'm 62. She's older than I am. We're asking the question, Lord, how do we maximize our time for you? How do we use it well? Listening to the one who speaks with authority the Son of God. You with me? All right, here's what I want us to do. I want us to work together in groups. I want you to work in this session with people right at your table, and I want you to consider some questions. I'm going to give you about 15 minutes or so to talk about these questions, and then I want to hear from you. I said to you already that I want to learn from you, and so as you discuss some of these things, and I ask for some feedback in just a little bit. I do that so that I can learn from you. And again, I trust be a better professor when I return back to the 
states. And so Dr. Bledsoe is going to bring up our PowerPoint. And there are three questions I want you to consider at your, at your table. Question number one is this. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest, how well do you think your students understand missions? The students you are teaching, how well do you think they understand this necessity of making disciples among the nations, of proclaiming the word, of doing this at the command of Jesus? Second question is a little broader than that. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest, how well do you think believers in your region understand missions? Not your students, but the believers in your region. How well do they understand this concept of the, the Great Commission? And then here's the, here's the third question. How might we as professors, as equippers, as teachers, whatever your particular role is, how might we help address these issues? I am frankly making some assumptions that your students and folks in the region where you serve probably need to be reminded too of the, of the Great Commission. I want to hear as you evaluate from 1 to 10 how much they need that, but I particularly want us to ask this question. How do we help address this issue with our students and with people in the places where we serve? Are we good? All right, I'll give you some time to discuss these questions among yourselves, and then I'll call for you to give me some report. Thank you.